Beautiful Rain is chapter one of Home, a Wayfarer story, which is due in early January of 2019. Here's Beautiful Rain, chapter one of Home, a Wayfarer story. It seemed that Jack Eaton had forgotten how to sleep. His five foot nine frame had laid awake on his cot in the main room of the cabin as his ears were assaulted by Dave Jameson's snores that sounded like a foghorn choking on a fishbone. Jack had likewise been listening to Marie Stonish moan through a nightmare. While Dave slept like a cadaver, his wife Marie's moans of Josiah and No were as chilling as a widow's sobs of mourning. Twice she gasped, Help! as though she was being strangled, and Jack was tempted to shake her and set her free from the entity that in the waking world was a top-secret Area 51 project gone awry. But if he woke her, he wouldn't be able to sneak out unnoticed. The warm, stuffy cabin had been part of a small FEMA camp that the Alphabet Agency had abandoned. Those who now called it home wouldn't open the windows at night for fear of providing easy access to desperate mobs that could sneak up the railroad bed or the old Erie Canal towpath. The quaint abode was armed to the proverbial teeth, but what good would the myriad of rifles and pistols do if they were snatched up by the invaders while the remnant there slept? And with Dave's snores as cover, those seeking the generous stash of food and water could slip through unlocked windows. The mobs would be seeking drugs as well, but a few bottles of Tylenol would be all they'd find as the morphine departed with those who set up the camp. The snores would provide Jack cover as well. It was too warm for the orange knit hat and black ski jacket that he'd been wearing upon arriving there in the snow. Now he sported the bright orange boonie hat that as an afterthought he'd shoved into his backpack before setting out in December on the journey that had brought him and Dave to the cabin. The navy blue t-shirt he wore had the FEMA logo screen printed across the shoulder blades, but a few days before he'd cut out a rectangular section of a white bed sheet. With a black permanent marker, he wrote the acronym AMF near the top, being the reverse of the alphabet agency. In smaller lettering along the bottom was written, A Man Entirely Free. With a needle and thread, this was sewn over the original screen printing like a mismatched nameplate on a football jersey. His ensemble was completed with camouflage BDU pants and black 5.11 Ranger shoes that were the best sneakers he'd ever worn. Everything except for his hat and black backpack were left behind by the U.S. government personnel that had built and initially run the camp. To be clear, the food and supplies inside his backpack were also from the camp. The green canteen strapped to the frame was Army issue, as was the Sig Sauer P320 holstered to his right thigh. There were 15 rounds in the magazine, and Jack hoped that none would need to be fired. A tactical knife was sheathed to his left hip, and he hoped that it would never need to penetrate human flesh. Attached to his pack was the portable AM-FM radio that had been carried with young Caden Gray, who'd accompanied him most of the way to the cabin. When Caden was called to embark on another journey by rail, he strapped it to Brad Ducey's backpack. Brad had made it to within yards of the cabin when he was gunned down by one of the mysterious snipers that was never pinpointed. A blood spot remained on the side of the radio below the volume dial, having splattered from Brad's head as the bullet impacted. Jack refused to wash it off, leaving it in memory of his departed friend. There were still inconsistent and erratic broadcasts over the AM band, and for Jack, it was a connection to better days and a way to monitor in a limited manner the ongoing current events. His smartphone had been discarded on the way westward along the snowy abandoned Erie Canal towpath that decades before was converted into a walking and biking trail. Jack had no use for the phone now, as nothing remained on the internet, which now operated without interruption, but communist and Satanist propaganda, including the promotion of transgenderism, non-gender, and so-called utopian ideals, all under the guise of news. 
The term post-truth had become new truth, and anyone in the independent media that espoused Christian or conservative viewpoints had been eliminated from the intelligent Web 1. In some cases, those voices of real truth were killed by the National Civilian Security Force or agents from NADIT, which was the North American Department of Information Truth. A new intelligent Web 2 had been created by free speech advocate and tech mogul Kane Datman. The .iw2 extension was employed by social media, news sites, forums, and a video channel called DatTube, all operating on the bright web. It was a haven for those hidden in the shadows and fearing for their lives that sought truth, fellowship, news, and information. The IW2 existed for only three weeks before Datman was found dead of natural causes in his Dallas home. That same day, ICANN eliminated the IW2 extension and the bright web went dark. Google had repaired itself after a destructive fire and was now called All. It was though it had become a living, breathing beast that could not only eliminate you from the internet, but likewise kill you without drawing a drop of blood. With IW1 as its hammer and sickle, it would tear down and reconstruct reality any way it chose to. Jack was no longer sure if it was being operated by Silicon Valley techs or if it was itself the master and the techs were the chopping and hammering slaves. Dave continued snoring, and Marie's nightmare had appeared to have come to an end. Two others slept quietly, their faces barely visible in flickering candlelight. Jack's bandmates Stan, Mick, and Kurt had left without a word three nights before, and it was crucial that he now slipped away with nary a trace. The thick wooden door was pushed open without a sound, and from the step, Jack pulled it closed. Once down the step, he turned to face the structure hidden in the wheel that was part of what he was sure had been the most unsecured detention camp in the nation. Like all such camps, it had never been listed or reported as a FEMA center. What existed as the U.S. federal government abandoned it in December, a week before Jack and Dave stepped through the cabin door and only two months after it had been opened. At that point, it had become a residence for which anyone there was free to leave. A gentle rain fell, not salty like the tears dripping from his hazel eyes and evaporating on his cheeks before rolling too far past his proud nose. His thin lips were clenched together like a trap that held a bear wanting to cry out in pain, but crying would be a waste of energy and resources. He could look back but wouldn't. The locks had been cut off the fencing before he'd arrived, and the only things that had kept him here were friendship and obviously the need for safety. He'd come here with the notion he'd needed to rescue his bandmates and hacker Matt Stonish. However, it was he that had been rescued. An invisible clock had been ticking in his head and keeping him awake over the last three nights. He was surprised he didn't hear his bandmates sneak out of the other cabin as he'd averaged two hours of sleep each of those nights. It was though he had an appointment to keep with someone who'd slipped in and out of vivid dreams during his brief periods of ancient slumber. It was too fuzzy for specifics, and yet he knew he had to get his feet moving. The narrow path was well-worn, and he stepped along with all due wariness garnished with a sour glaze of paranoia. The pond to his right was shrouded by brush and a thick curtain of fog. He could walk the path with his eyes closed if need be, and that allowed for a long glance at the water as his legs moved at a pace short of a jog. A moment later, he stopped and stood at an opening on the east bank. The only sound was the pattering of the rain on the surrounding leaves and fauna. He stared out over the water that the fog allowed to be visible just along the marl bank as the thoughts that raced through his mind were overlaid with the notion that this was a beautiful rain. With those thoughts were lyric lines and a melody that weaved through his spirit, and if he was ever able to write another song, he'd use them. Beautiful rain gentle beautiful rain drowning the flames of my pain your voice your fingertips 
strawberry sunrise of your lips, until we get home, refresh me, beautiful rain. As he sang softly to himself, he reached his left arm back to snatch the white, unlabeled can of government-issue insect repellent from an open pocket in his backpack. It worked better than anything ever offered for sale to the public, and it smelled like fabric softener. He wasn't a big man, so it was a cinch to spray every accessible section from his shoulders and to his feet before applying a heavy dose onto a blue bandana from the same pocket. He then wiped his forehead, face, and neck, and satisfied that he was armored against the mosquitoes, flies, and ticks, he shoved the bandana back into his backpack. He couldn't linger at the pond's edge for fear that he'd change his mind and return to the cabin. Not knowing the precise time on this cool yet humid morning, he estimated that it was seven o'clock and those back at the camp would be rising soon. They'd wonder where he was and begin searching and he wanted to be as far eastward on the canal towpath as possible. He was about to resume his short trek to the towpath when he was halted by a sound. It was a splash out on the water, but the fog kept its source invisible. He assumed it was a largemouth bass terminating the life of a dragonfly that hovered too close to the surface, but then there were three more splashes in quick succession. His next thought was that it was a carp undertaking their raucous spawning ritual, but that annual fish orgy had ended two weeks prior. There were four more splashes over a second's time, followed by a hollow thud. Jack instantly identified that sound as a paddle impacting the side of a canoe. He couldn't see through the fog, but estimated by the repeating sequence of sounds, this time with two paddle whacks, that they were 50 yards out. The sounds became disorganized, but he could tell that they were at a proverbial snail's pace moving toward the camp. It was then that the rain stopped. Likewise, all was silent out on the water. He strained to see but he may as well have been looking at a concrete gray wall. He found it peculiar that the fog was only over the pond and nowhere else. Above him, the sky was a blanket of various grays with random strands of purple woven through as though having been knitted by a grandma on acid. Some of the clouds were misshapen blobs and twists that made Jack think that it was the engineer's first day on the job at Harp headquarters in Alaska. Oh, wait! The military suspended that program, was the skeptical snicker that burst through his lips louder than he would have desired. He hoped that whoever or whatever might be out in the canoes didn't hear him. All remained quiet save for the hammering of his heart in his ears. The two parts of each beat like the slam of a sledge, followed by the strike of a smaller one used for framing. There were no more splashes, no more pitter-pattering raindrops and no birds chirping. No trains clicked along the nearby CSX main line, and the asphalt of the New York State Thruway a mile away was mute ribbon offering nothing in the way of diesel engines and whining tires. Very little freight moved since the collapse, or what had been reported as such by the government media the last time he'd gone online. Jack was unsure of what kind of government was or wasn't in control of what might or might not have been the United States of America. The dreams during his coma years hadn't taken him this far. He didn't see this day and hadn't expected to be on the earth this long. He was alone in this physical realm, relying on Christ's Holy Spirit to guide him. He felt that the sounds on the water came from danger heading for those at the camp, and it was the Holy Spirit that spoke no, don't go back, a millisecond before he would have prayed to ask if he should. But Lord, shouldn't I run back? He gasped, questioning what he thought he'd heard that still soft voice speak from a place that wasn't his mind or his ears. It was then that the snapping of twigs and fallen branches shattered the silence. The noise stung his ears like a cyclone of drill bits, while the soil below his feet vibrated like a 4.0 magnitude earthquake. Turning to face the invisible drill bits, he instead saw a herd of white-tailed deer stampeding along the trail from the direction of the camp. A mere 18 inches separated him from the leaping and galloping animals, and a hot breeze slapped his face as the procession 
rumbled past in a frantic parade toward the towpath. There were twenty-one in the herd, and as they scaled the short rise that on the other side descended to the towpath, he whispered, Roger that, Lord. He dashed up the slick and muddy rise and then pussyfooted down into the wet grass that edged the towpath that was a mix of gravel and exposed soil. As he slipped to a stop, he twirled his arms to maintain his balance and not fall onto his face. Once steady on his feet, he repositioned the backpack that had slid askew. After retying his right shoelace, he first looked west and then east and saw nothing but trees, brush, and the disfigured gray and purple sky. There were no deer in either direction, and after all the strangeness he'd experienced in life, he shrugged his shoulders to express to no one his lack of surprise in that discovery. A foul stench hooked his nostrils and pulled his attention to a break in the canal side weeds and brush. In this section of the historic ditch, the water had only been two feet deep for decades. But now, as he squinted while peering down into the bed, he saw no water at all, despite the rain that had fallen all night and into the morning. He'd last ventured to this spot on a sunny morning two weeks prior when he'd abandoned his first attempt to leave the camp after being struck like lightning with the notion that he was resetting a clock that he had no authority to put his hands on. On that morning, the usual shadows had still existed, and a few carp had been visible as they rooted in the mud bottom looking for whatever edibles may have suited their palates. Now only one carp was present. It was stiff and dead, although retaining part of the brown and gold coloration displayed during its life. The fact that a touch of the coloration remained told Jack that the fish had been dead no more than a day. What troubled him was that the fish laid on the bottom that held not even a puddle. Clumped on the bottom around it were strands of coontail and layers of duckweed left thirsty without a trace of life-giving water. The stink of death on the air reminded him of the time as a child when the septic tank under the backyard of his family's home overflowed into the grass, creating a convenient breeding ground for hoverflies. His father had dug a short ditch to drain off the sewer water until a repair crew could come and fix the tank. The ditch was the width of a shovel blade and three inches deep, and Jack recalled watching grotesque rat-tailed maggots swim like tadpoles through the liquid waste. He didn't know if he should cry or vomit, so he decided to opt out of both. His eyes clenched shut and his jaw tightened to the point that he thought his teeth might crumble. The old familiar headache fingered its way from back to front across his skull, making him think of the 1970s Let Your Fingers Do the Walking Bell Telephone Yellow Pages TV commercials. He drew a sharp breath through his nostrils, but the air morphed into needle-nose pliers of putrid stink that flipped the yellow pages from his mind's lampstand before depositing maggots there to wiggle and writhe. Jack exhaled with a piercing moan, then with a head jerk opened his eyes. He wished the fog that hung over the pond was here, but instead he was left with the same heartbreaking view. It was more painful than the chronic headaches, so he snapped himself to face east. He needed to head in the direction that he, Dave, Brad, and Caden had come during the freak double storms on that December day. There was something behind him to the west that he couldn't see, and he needed to flee the sanctuary that could now be a killing field. You are a piss-ass little coward, Jack. You're bailing on your friends in their time of greatest need was the hissy, raspy whisper that taunted his right ear. In his periphery, he saw the black cloak and hood. The others had been subjected to the taunts, but only Jack and Dave were able to see what they referred to as Mr. Jones. Before Jack could utter a rebuke, Jones disappeared, not wanting to hear the name of Jesus. Jack was sure that Mr. Jones would be back, knowing the worst things to say at the absolute worst times. Jack did in fact feel like a coward who was bailing on his friends. The guilt was a two-headed, red-eyed black rodent that gnawed through his abdomen and into his chest. The thing likewise had two tails that seemed to become his femurs and tibias, causing his suddenly weak legs to give out and collapse him to his hands and knees. 
Lord God, I need to get back and stand with my friends, he groaned as his fingers dug into loose, wet gravel and his legs felt detached from his body. In his mind, each of his legs was a wriggling rat's tail with a leech's mouth where his foot should be. The mouths whispered, the, the left one chiming in first with, Coward! Not to be outdone, the right whispered next, announcing with glee, And a piss-assed one to boot! Jack's hellish head trip ended as quickly as it began by what sounded like two rifle shots. His legs were strong again, and in a flash he was back on the feet that were, in fact, his feet. Without forethought, he turned toward the rise that began the path to the cabin. But standing on it as a mammalian wall were three of the bucks that had been at the head of the herd of twenty-one, behind them as a curtain that hid the trees, and likewise wafting around them was the fog that had lurked over the pond. The precise sound he'd heard before issued forth again only once this time. He realized that it wasn't a rifle, but a snort. It echoed off things unseen, yet very, very present. Each of the deer appeared to be staring at him, challenging him. Jack couldn't maintain his counter stare and shifted his eyes left to right and then back again. He observed that two of the bucks had 12-point racks, which would be a prize for a hunter. He blinked four times before shaking his head as his attention was drawn to the one that stood in the center position. The deer was different, and it wasn't that it was the largest buck he'd ever seen with a shoulder height of five feet. It stepped downward on the rise, sure-footed and strong, and when it halted, it appeared to have blood on all four hooves. The buck stared at Jack as though it saw inside his very spirit, causing the man to look away from its eyes. His attention was then drawn to its antlers, and it took but one heartbeat's time for Jack to realize that this buck's rack had 18 points. His breath was taken away as while most of the antler rack was the normal gray and brown, the three points at the top of each side were a metallic gold in hue. The gold reflected an unseen light source, as though the sun was shining and the points were angled forward as if ready for battle. The buck snorted again at a lower, more intimate volume, and with its right front hoof pawed into the mud. It then dropped its head as though it was preparing to charge him, but Jack knew that wasn't the case. His eyes teared and his breaths were hitched as he knew now there was no turning back. As he began to step eastward, he glanced back and saw that while the wall of fog remained, the three bucks were gone as the beautiful rain started falling again. That was Beautiful Rain, Chapter 1 of Home, a Wayfarer story, slated for release in early January of 2019.